Okay, welcome back everybody to BC, our second lecture on BC 308, Revelation and Daniel. Uh, we have three lectures today. This is our second lecture. And I was just responding to a question on the chat. Um, going below us a question about trumpets. So, you know, for, uh, in relation to the rapture, that's in First Thessalonians chapter 4 and in First Corinthians chapter 15, we hear the sounding of the trumpets there as well. And then here in the book of Revelation, we are reading about seven trumpets being sounded. And so what is the connection? And uh, because the trumpet already took place, uh, or the rapture we're saying has already happened. So to respond to that, I will just point us back to our second year course notes, uh, where we, the in our BC 208, two, sorry, 213, yeah, 213 course, the end times. Um, as we started talking about the end times, the sequence of events, we had a full section here about the trumpet of God. And we discussed, you know, okay, well, what are these two? Why is, why is it talking about the trumpet of God based on 1 Thessalonians 4.16, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. What is the significance of the trumpet? And then we said, um, you know, we couldn't confuse this with the trumpets that we read about as... Um, the seven trumpets announcing the judgments. Uh, there's another trumpet at the second coming of Christ. Uh, and so what is the significance of the last trumpet used here? And first Thessalonians 4.16, 1 Corinthians 15.52. And um, so we said here that the last trumpet is signifying the end of the church age. And shouldn't be confused with the trumpets we're reading about through the tribulation. Because as we talk about the tribulation, there are seven trumpets, the seven trumpet judgments. There's another trumpet being sounded at the end of the tribulation when Christ comes before the battle of Armageddon. But this is a trumpet that's being sounded at the end of the church age. That is, before, that's indicating the rapture. It's likely that there are true trumpets being sounded. The first trumpet is the Lord descending from heaven, and and the second trumpet is the resurrection and the catching up of the saints. So there are two. So the sound of the last trumpet, the dead in Christ rise, second one, second or last trumpet. So you explain this here in uh, in our second year course. I'm sorry for taking us back there, but it, I think it's uh, uh, it's explained there. So you can just revisit those notes. They should help you. Is that okay? Um, okay, got it. All right, so the last trumpet. Yeah, so that the two trumpets, first and second, in relation to the end of the church age. All right. So, yeah. So we were now in... Revelation chapter 11 and verse 3, that's where we paused before the break, and we're going to pick up from there. So what we, so let's, let's, let, let's introduce this thought. You see, when we are describing or sharing with somebody a story, a sequence of events, sometimes as we are narrating the story, we might take a certain point, go to the end of the story, then come back and continue the story with other things that we need to cover. For example, if you're talking about a story and you're saying, hey, you know, here's a, here's a person, John, and John was doing all this, and, and then you kind of, you know, you talk about John's whole life till the end of the story, then you come back and say, well, yeah, while well, John was 23, and you continue on the story. Or sometimes when you're telling a story, you, 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 you're giving a story, and then you go back in time. You go say, okay, well, for you to understand this, let me tell you what else happened in the past. And we do that in our conversation. 
So Revelation chapter 11, 12, and 13 are like that. Revelation chapter 11 introduces to us the two witnesses. And it talks to us about the two witnesses and what they do for next three and a half years. Then it comes back to the middle point. Then chapter 12 again talks to us about, it's in the middle midpoint, and it talks to us about what is going to happen with the Israel for the next three and a half years. All right, somebody's mic is on. You can turn it off, please. Mute it, please. And then chapter 13 comes back to the middle of the tribulation and talks to us about the Antichrist and the false prophet. And it tells us what they're going to do for the second half of the tribulation, the three and a half years. So, Revelation chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, all start in the middle of the tribulation, but they are narrating something, they are revealing something about something specific that happens for three and a half years. The, the, the two witnesses are going to be on the earth for three and a half years. So, we read about them only in Revelation chapter 11, but in chapter 11 it tells us what they are going to do for three and a half years. Chapter 12 again picks up in the middle of the tribulation, talks about Israel, it gives us a little background, it takes us behind in time about the dragon, that is Satan, Lucifer himself, tells us what, the, what Lucifer is going to do to Israel during the next three and a half years. Chapter 13 again starts off in the middle of the tribulation, and uh, we will see. The reason we can say with confidence that it's starting off in the middle of the tribulation is because it gives us the timing. Just like how in Revelation 11 verses 1 and 2 it says, uh, uh, 1, 2 and 3, it says, you know, 42 months, 1,260 days. You see that given to us in chapter 12 as well. So we know. We can state with confidence what we are saying. Chapter 13 again, similarly. It starts in the middle. It tells us what the Antichrist and false prophet will be doing for three and a half years. Is that clear? So, Revelation 11, 1, 11, 3, God says there are going to be two witnesses. And they are going to be ministering for three and a half years, 1,260 days. Now, these two witnesses, who are these two witnesses? The names are not mentioned here, but uh, we know Malachi chapter 4 verse 4, he talks about, God says, you know, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest they come and smite the earth with a curse. So God has spoken through Malachi the prophet, saying he will send Elijah. So one of these two witnesses is Elijah. Now, Somebody may say, well, John the Baptist came. Yes, John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, but he was not Elijah. And in Matthew 17, when Jesus was asked about John the Baptist, he said, yes, Elijah has come and he is yet to come. So he was referring to John the Baptist saying, yeah, this is, Eli this is you know, in one sense, Elijah has come, meaning there's somebody who's come in the spirit and power of Elijah, but Elijah is yet to come, Matthew 17. So, verses 11 and 12. So, even the Lord Jesus pointed and said, Elijah is going to come. So, we can state with confidence, based on Malachi, 4, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, as well as Matthew 17, verse 11 and 12, we can state that one of these two witnesses will be Elijah. We don't know who the other, the next witness is, so it's anybody's guess. Some people talk about Enoch, some people say it's Moses, we don't know. But if you go by the criteria, one of the criteria which is Elijah never died physically, he was caught up and taken up into a in the chariot to heaven. So the only other person like Elijah would be Enoch. 
Enoch also didn't die physically. So we could say based on that criteria, the second witness would be Enoch. That's kind of a more of a deduction or a, uh, you know, a, a, a logical uh, conclusion we can come to, but we cannot prove it from scripture. So that's, so we just have to leave it there. Uh, some people say it's Moses because, uh, you know, Moses appe appeared with Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration along with Jesus. So they say, okay, maybe it's Moses, but um, we don't know. It does, Moses doesn't fit the criteria of not dying, which Elijah has. Verse 4, Revelation 11, verse 4 says, There are these two olive trees and two lampstands standing before God on the earth. So here's again some prophetic imagery. We know. Trees can represent people. Psalm 1 verse 3. He will be like a tree planted by rivers of water. All live trees represent men or ministers of God. Lampstand can represent the church. Lampstand can also represent ministers of God. Prophetic pictures. Right? So keep that in mind. He says these two olive trees. Talking about the two witnesses, he's calling them olive trees. So all they are representing the figurative. Olive trees are figurative of servants of God. Two lampstands, figurative of servants of God, right? And the parallel is in Zechariah chapter four, uh, verse eleven to fourteen, where there uh, in Zechariah four as well, olive trees are used to represent leaders or ministers of God. Now, these two witnesses are serving the Lord, and they do mighty signs and wonders. Just like Elijah in the Old Testament, they could call fire from down from heaven. They can speak, and you know, people's lives are affected. They shut up heaven for no rain, or they have power to turn waters um, into blood. Now, some people look at that and say, "Oh, that, Moses did that. So maybe it's Moses." Well, we don't know. Elijah could also do the same. And then, so they did. The purpose of these two witnesses during the second half of the tribulation is explained for us in Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6. It is to turn the people to God and the people towards each other, to bring reconciliation with God and with people, uh, lest the earth be completely destroyed. So they're, they're serving in that capacity during that period of time. But then what happens to them? Let's read, please, from verses 7 to, uh, I guess we can read from verse 7 to 14. Revelation 11, 7 to 14, three verses each, please. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And the dead bodies will lie in the secret of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the people's tribes, towns, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days, and not allow them dead bodies to be put into graves. Thank you. Verse 10 onwards, somebody. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after the three and a half year, days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here and this. They ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Okay, verse 13 and 14, somebody. In, in the same hour, there was a earth, great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woo is past. Behold, the third woo is coming quickly. Amen. Mm. So, 
remember John is seeing all of this in a vision, and God is showing him things that are going to take place. So there are these two witnesses, prophets, for three and a half years they're ministering on the earth, they're doing all these mighty things in order to turn people to God, and so on. And then towards the end of the three and a half years, so now we're, we're coming towards the end of the three and a half years, He's telling us what will happen towards the end. The beast, verse 7, the beast. So this is the first time this term is introduced to us, the beast. We will say, right, uh, now we will give it to you in chapter 13, we will see clearly. This beast, the beast, the term the beast is referring to the Antichrist. Okay, chapter 13 will explain that to us. But now, this term is in the beast, and he's coming from the bottomless pit. That doesn't mean that the man itself is from there. The man is a human being, but he is empowered by hell, the dragon, the devil. The beast, the Antichrist, is going to kill them, kill them both. And their bodies are going to be lying in the city of Jerusalem. That's verse 8. But at that time, the city of Jerusalem is going to be so corrupt, it's, so, it's going to be so depraved. It's going to be spiritual, it's going to be called Sodom and Egypt. Sodom for its immorality, Egypt for its idolatry. So that means, at that time, Jerusalem spiritually will be a very depraved city. Now, Jerusalem is the city of God. Jerusalem will be the city from which Jesus rules. But at that time, or by that time, which means by the end of the tribulation, by that time, it has become spiritually, it has become like Sodom and Egypt. And uh, partly it's because by that time, the, the Gentiles have come in, overtaken that city. And the Antichrist has set himself up as God there, the beast. And so morally, it has become very, very, it's gone the other direction. So in the city of Jerusalem, now we know it's Jerusalem because verse 8 says, where also our Lord was crucified, that great city. So that's the city of Jerusalem. Now, at that time, that these two prophets will be killed by this beast and they're going to let their bodies lie on the streets of Jerusalem and he's saying here that the whole world verse 9 they're going to see them lying there on the street for three and a half days now think about this when John was you know John this was 2,000 years ago when John is saying the whole world is going to see them, physically it was an impossibility during John's time. But today it's a possibility. That means today, you know, we can be seated in any part of the world and we can see live what's happening somewhere. Today it's a possibility. And people can see it on their phones. It says, Peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations. That means multitude people, and which is so true, which is so possible. Today, on your mobile phone, you can live stream, you know, whatever news channel you connect to, you can get a live stream, and in real time, you can see what's happening somewhere else in some other part of the world. Maybe, you know, even I would say 30 years ago. This was not possible 20, 30 years ago. This was not possible in real time. Of course, you could read the news or watching television later, but in real time, this is possible today. That means that's how close we are 
to the fulfillment of these prophecies. When John was writing, it was an impossibility. How could people from everywhere see what two dead men lying in the street of Jerusalem? How could that happen? They didn't have cameras. They had nothing during John's time. Here we are 2,000 years later, and it's absolutely possible. And so people are, verse 10, people are going to be so happy. Hey, we got rid of these two prophets because, you know, they were trying to get, they, their preaching was causing people to repent to, and turn to God. And uh, verse 11, after three and a half days, while people are watching in real time, they're going to see these people get onto their feet. And they're going to see them ascend to God. God's going to say, come up here. And that's going to be a great earthquake. A tenth, one tenth of the city of Jerusalem will fall. And there'll be lots of people who are going to turn to God. Verse 13, 7,000 people will be killed. Now, think about this. What John wrote in Revelation 11, like these details, which if John was to logically write in his time, he would not have written this. He would not have said, people from all over the world can see their dead bodies lying in the city streets of the city of Jerusalem. He would not have said that because logically it was not possible in his day and time. But he was being given a prophetic vision. He was being given a message from the Lord about things that were yet to come. And he wrote it down. And we are living in a day and time when we can say, we can read it and say, yeah, it's easy. Everybody turn on the phone, watch a live stream, and you can see these two dead bodies in the street of Jerusalem. You can see it. It's, it's possible in our time. So, having given us this part, John is coming back and, and, and he hears the message saying, okay, The second war is past. The third war is coming quickly, meaning now we're going to transition into the final war. So each of these each of these sets of judgments are referred to as war. So the first seal, first set of seven seals, first war. The second set of seven trumpets, second war. The third set of bold judgments is the third war. So he says the second war is past, meaning it's going to be done. That's verse 15 is the last of the seven trumpets. And then it's the third war. That's the last set that's going to take. So just announcing that's that's going to happen. So Revelation 11, from the middle of the tribulation till the end of the tribulation, in relation to the two witnesses and what will happen to them and what their ministry will be like, what will happen to them and what effect it will have on the people of the earth. So he's given us that. Now uh, we see the seventh trumpet being sounded. Verses, so we'll read verses 15 to 19. The seventh trumpet is being sounded. Now remember, we have crossed over the middle line. So the sixth trumpet is before the middle of the tribulation. The seventh trumpet is sounded once we cross over the middle of the tribulation, somewhere there. Now, the seventh trumpet sounds is more of an announcement of things going to be wrapped up. Right? So it's 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 not actually something an event happening at that moment, but say, hey, this is what's going to happen soon. So, Revelation eleven verses fifteen to. 19, please. Somebody could read that. Uh, three verses each, please. Version 11, 15 onwards, three verses each. 
and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our lord and of his christ and he shall reign forever and ever and the four and twenty elders which sat before god on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped god saying we give thee thanks o lord god almighty which art and was and art to come because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned thank you was 18 on the nations were angry and your wrath has come in the, the town of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name small and great should destroy those who destroy the earth Then the temple of God was open in heaven, and the ark of His covenant was seen in His temple. And there were lightning, noises, thundering, and earthquake, and great hail. Okay, so the seventh trumpet is primarily an announcement. So we will see, you know, we have seen, and we will see uh, numerous announcements being made uh, throughout the seven years of. Seven-year period, and this seventh trumpet is an announcement. The announcement that the that God is going to triumph over all the kingdoms of the earth, and He's going to reign. Saying, "Look, this is going to happen." Right. So this is it. It literally happens in Revelation 19. You know. So you you know if we when we come to Revelation 19, we will see this announcement literally being fulfilled when Christ returns. But this is an announcement. Okay. The kingdoms of this earth have become the kingdoms of our nation. Uh, kingdoms of the earth have become the kingdoms of our Christ, and He's going to reign forever. That's going to actually literally happen. And then there's worship happening in heaven. And while that is happening, uh, there is verse 19. Uh, there's lightning, thundering, earthquakes. So things are just being shaken on the earth at the seventh trumpet. Now, we come to chapter 12. Chapter 12 is similar to chapter 11, meaning as we read the chapter, we will see that, again, there's a reference made to 1,260 days or 42 months or three and a half years. That means chapter 12 is telling us something that's going to happen over that three and a half, the second half of the tribulation. It has to... Chapter 12 deals with how Satan is going to go after Israel primarily, as well as to go after people who have the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ for that three and a half year period. But chapter 12 also tells us a little bit about what past. Oh, this is how the great dragon came about. This is who the great dragon is. You need to know a little bit about his past. And it tells us something that's going to happen in the heavenly, spiritual, in the middle of the tribulation. So that's chapter 12. It's so talking about, about the dragon, S Satan, his past, what he's going to do in the middle of the tribulation. He's going to try to get up into heaven and try to ascend. One make his one final attempt to break into the heavens, the throne of God. That's where he wanted to be seated all the time. He's going to try to break there, break in through there. He will not be able to. So he'll come back to the earth. Uh, I mean, he'll be forced. Uh, he, he won't be able to enter heaven, so he'll be forced back to the earth. He knows his time is short, just three and a half years left. And he is going to go with full vengeance against Israel and those who have the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's chapter 12. So let's read that. Revelation 12, verse 1 through 6, please. Three verses each. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she, as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. 
He still drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She, she bore a new child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was father to God and his strength. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed here their 1,260 days. Hmm. All right. So this passage in Revelation 12 has been a very difficult passage for many. Uh, this, you know, okay, what's going on here? What's he talking about? When does this happen? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But actually, if you read it, uh, it's pretty simple. So read it and you know understand the the the, the prophetic imagery. It's pretty simple. So here in these six verses, we are having three characters or three figures. We are having this picture of this woman. Verse, chapter 12, verse 1. This woman, she's clothed with the sun, the moon, and she's got 12 stars. Like, what a strange picture. And then you have this red dragon. You would think, red dragon, does that represent China? You know, relax. There's a red dragon. And he's got, verse 3, he's got seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems. Okay, what does, what does all that mean? And then there's this child, a male child. Who is this male child? Right? Now, I know we've discussed this in the past, but just to refresh our memory, when you look at these verses, the first conclusion about the male child is, we can conclude easily who the male child is, because it says here, the male child, verse 5, is going to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and he was caught up to the throne of God. So that's Jesus Christ. Jesus, Revelation 19, tells us very clearly, Revelation 19, verse 15, tells us very clearly he's going to rule the nations with the rod of iron. Hey, that's Jesus. And then he was the one who was caught up. He was taken up into heaven. So the male child, we can clearly point and say, that's Jesus. But then who's the woman? Who's the red dragon? Now, the red dragon, he, you know, if you read on, uh, when you read on a few more verses, in which we will do, uh, it's given to us very clearly here that the red dragon, that's verse, I'm looking at verse 9, the great dragon, the serpent of old, the devil and Satan. So, red dragon, clear. That's the devil. Not China, but it's the devil, red dragon. What do the seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his head mean? Verse 3, seven represents perfection. Seven heads talking about his authority, seven diadems talking about his uh, rulership on the earth at that time. Ten horns pointing to the ten leaders who are going to be you know, the horns always represents leaders or leadership or kings. Uh, the, te the ten horns are important because they will come up in chapter 13 and we will cross-reference them to what we saw in Daniel. Daniel, we saw ten toes, we saw ten horns. We are seeing ten horns here again. We are seeing ten horns again in chapter 13. So the ten horns are representing these ten leaders who are going to be influenced to carry out, uh, you know, the, they're going to be supporting the Antichrist and, um, you know, leading things up to the end times. We will, we will look at that in chapter 13. So the red dragon is given to us very clearly in verse 9. That's the devil. Then who is this woman? Because the woman gave birth to the male child, which we said is Jesus Christ, because it's only Jesus who's going to rule the nations with the rod of iron. It's Jesus who was taken up to the Father. So who is the woman? Now, the woman cannot be the church, because the church didn't give birth to Jesus. 
Jesus established the church after he went up to heaven. He built his church after he went up to heaven. So it cannot be the church. But the, the woman then is Israel. And we can corroborate that from what we know in Genesis 20, 37, verse 9. In Genesis 37, verse 9, Joseph had a dream. And in his dream, he saw his father and mother, that's Jacob. Jacob and his uh, Jacob and his mother, and he saw his eleven brothers as the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars. And that matches so perfectly with Revelation 12, verse 1. The woman clothed with the sun, the moon, the twelve stars, twelve tribes of Israel. So this picture is a figurative representation of the nation of Israel. So the woman represents the nation of Israel. The male child represents Jesus Christ. The red dragon is the, the devil. Clear? Any questions on that? And then look at verse 6. So what is this dragon trying to do? So it gives us a little bit of history about the dragon. Sorry, let me just back up to verse 4. Talking about this dragon, it says, His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. That means this dragon, in somewhere in time past, so influenced one third of the angels of God, stars representing the angels of God. He so influenced the angels of God and he with his tail, meaning he has so influenced them and he drew them to the earth. So this dragon has one third of the angelic beings created by God with him. For every fallen angel, there are two of God's angels, right? So we know that one third of the angels rebelled along with this dragon when he fell, when he was sent to the earth. And secondly, what else can we see? We see that this dragon was trying to devour the woman. That means he was trying to attack Israel. And it says here in verse 6, The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So 1,260 days, three and a, 42 months, three and a half years. So once again, we can say, Revelation chapter 12 is talking to us about the, the 42 months, the 1,260 days during the second half tribulation. So it starts in the middle and goes all the way till the end of the second half of the tribulation. And what is going to happen? This woman, that is the people of Israel, are going to flee to the wilderness and they're going to be preserved there. So now many people ask, where is this wilderness? And we'll read about this again uh, later on in this chapter. Where is this wilderness? The, where she's, the people of Israel are going to be preserved for three and a half years. One of the uh, suggested or possible answers is in the region of Jordan. So Jordan neighbors or borders along Israel. And uh, that whole area is like desert land, wilderness. And uh, it is quite possible that when, and from the, from the start, from the middle of the seven years, or the start of the three and a half years, when the Antichrist begins to really go after Israel, that a lot of the Jews will be dispersed and they will move across Jordan uh, uh, into the space just to protect themselves, just to hide from persecution. Very possible. Okay. Now, any questions so far? Verse 7 onwards, 
tell, so remember now, we are in the middle of the tribulation, three and a half years, 1,260 days are going on now. What's happening here at this time? Let's read verses 7, and we will read till verse 12, please. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 12, three verses each. Somebody could read it for us, please. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of the old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole nation, whole world. He was cast to the earth, and its angels were cast out with him. Thank you. Verse 10 to 12, please. Somebody. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast out, and they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, O to the inhabitant, inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a soft time. Hmm. Thank you. So now, um, there has been, and it, I guess it probably will continue, a lot of debate on the timing, the timing of these events described in verses 7 through 12. Is John describing something of the past? Because Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall as a lightning from heaven. Luke 10, 17, so, uh, Luke 10, 17, 18. Is, is it something of the past or is it something else? Now, I can tell, I will tell you what I feel convinced about. I feel that Revelation 12, verses 7 to 12, is recording what is going to happen in the middle of the tribulation. It's not something that took place in the past. That was already there, described to us in Revelation 12, verses 3 and 4, when this red dragon was th thrown to the earth, and verse 4, he took a third of the stars with him, and he came to the earth. That was, I beheld Satan fall as a lightning from heaven. He was thrown out of heaven. He took a third of the angels with him. That's already described. But verses 7 to 12, what I can, I'm convinced is, it's describing what is going to happen in the middle of the tribulation. Why do we say that? Because at the end of that sequence of events, the devil comes back to the earth saying, knowing that he has just a short time. And there's 1,260 days, three and a half years. And he knows he has a short time. So what, what happens there? In the middle of that tribulation, Satan is making one last attempt to invade heaven. It's the war in the heavens. Because if his primary goal was to take the throne of God. That's what he wanted. He wanted to be on that throne. By now he's sitting on the temple in Jerusalem. He's got his man there, the Antichrist. He's not happy with that. He wants that throne. And so he's making his final attempt. Satan and his angels are making a final attempt into heaven and there Michael and his angels are fighting back and they're saying no place here and uh, he is cast out verse end of verse 9 he's cast to the earth and his angels and say hey that's the only place for giving you permission now and then there is celebration in heaven verse 10 Salvation belongs to our God. The accuser of the brethren has been cast down. I mean, this devil, he's the accuser of brethren. He's been accusing God's people day and night, and he's been sent. But even the brethren, they, are, they overcame him, verse 11. They, are over, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of testimony, meaning that's how the, even the brethren are living victorious 
over this devil through the blood of the Lamb. Verse 12 says, But earth, sorry to tell you, woe to the earth, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. We've got bad news for you because the devil has come back and he is mad. He comes, he's come with great wrath. He is so angry because, verse, end of verse 12, he knows his time is short. So because it's telling us, you know, he at the end of verse 12, his time is short. Therefore, you connect it back to all the events of verses 7 to 12. Hey, so therefore, this is an event that happens right there in the middle of the tribulation. There's only 1,260 days left. There's only 42 months. And the devil knows the time is short. He's so angry. That's why, you know, I say, I feel convinced that what 7 to 12, verses 7 to 12, record is something that is going to happen in heaven. It's not something about the past. It's not going to happen in the heavenlies. When Satan makes his one final attempt to try to break through, he cannot. And his only option is you can operate on earth for three and a half years. That's all you've got. And during this last three and a half years, he goes after the woman. That's Israel and after those who are following Jesus Christ. So let's quickly read verses 13 through um, thirteen through 17, please. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth and he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she, she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times and a half from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth, like a flood after the, after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth held the woman, and the earth opened its mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and has the test and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. So this is what happening in the second half of the tribulation. So we said, chapter 12 is describing basically what the devil is doing against Israel and against those who have the testimony of Jesus. So once the devil is cast down back to the earth, you've, you've got a short time, you've got only three and a half years left, he goes after the woman, which is the nation of Israel. But God helps her escape. So he uses the picture of a great eagle, uh, you know, flying very high. He's just telling us that God is going to help the people of Israel escape the attack of this dragon they're going to be gone into the wilderness uh so like we said earlier it's possible that it's is referring to the region um, of jordan that borders israel as a nation so people run off are trying to escape there or they could escape out into other parts of the world uh, but the dragon spews flood now that's a strange thing because a sub you can't imagine a snake spewing out water right you we we can imagine a snake having its fangs and trying to hurt people but to imagine a snake spewing out water is a strange thing but water as we see in the book of revelation and we will see it in chapter 17 represents people so basically the dragon is instigating people which we will see very correctly we will see also in chapter 16 that he instigates people to go after the Jews. So, you know, if you put it in our modern day language, anti Semitism will be on the rise, will be at its height during this second half of the three and a half years of the seven year tribulation. People are going to go after the Jews, instigated by the devil to kill the Jewish people. That's the, the nation of Israel. And uh, but God is going to protect these people. He's going to protect the Jews. He's going to protect Israel as a nation. 
So the devil is going to be so mad about this. He's going to try to instigate as many people to go after the Jews. And verse, verse 12, verse 17, those of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So there will be both Jews and there will also be others during the tribulation who will keep the commandments of God and they will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now the phrase, the testimony of Jesus Christ, you will see in Revelation 19.10, referring to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of prophecy. He is the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it's telling us here once again that there will be people during the tribulation who believe in Jesus and they will have the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to go for our second break. When we come back after the break, we get into chapter 13, where we read about the beast and the false prophet, or the first beast and the second beast. And we're going to see again what the what Satan is going to empower these people to do, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Who is the false prophet? And what are they going to do in the second half of the tribulation? Okay. So let's take a break. I hope all of you are following me. I hope you're not getting tired, overwhelmed. Everybody's okay. I hope you're not going through tribulation. Okay. Fine. Okay. Good. Let's go for a break and um, we'll come back and take this forward. Thank you.